Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's good to see you here. And I, I, I have to be honest, I, 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 just, I didn't want to see the rain, but I don't think it's ever going to quit. I, I'm, about to, I'm about to give up on that. The, um, I'm going to, if any first time visitors in here with us this morning, raise your hand if you are. She scratched her ear right there and I started to. <laughs> okay. Uh, Edmaran Church Council is going to meet uh, tomorrow at 6.30. The Women of the Bible left lecture, and she, you're going to get some comments on this in a minute. I'm going to finish up my part first. They have the homeless offering on the 23rd, and Women of the Bible course is on the 22nd. Uh, I'd like to say something about that very first announcement down there, about a huge thank you to everyone. I couldn't thank this congregation and people of this community anymore. There's just no words left when we took on this uh, Alan McElhaney fundraiser. I'm proud to be able to tell everybody worked. I mean, they came together. My grandson's in medical school. He came up and he pulled pork for six hours. And, and uh, we, fellowship was, it was best explained by Jimmy. He came over to the house last Saturday and bought uh, some more money. We turned that in, and he looked at me and said, I want to say something to you. And I said, yeah, Jimmy, you can say anything you want to. He said, I've never seen such love in action is I saw when I walked in your fellowship hall and saw how everybody just jumps in and gets it done. He said, I, I just can't believe that. We, he said, we just, I have a tough time with our area. And I said, well, that's just the way we are. We all love the Lord. We all know this is an important thing, and we did it. So anyway, I want to thank you. As it stands right now, we have gotten $16,140.51. Get... And uh, I think if I give Becky any more money, she's going to throw me out of her house. The, uh, <laughs> she said that I, so I just give it to her husband, let him take it to her when it comes in. Anyway, it's, it'll stay alive for a little bit longer, and then I think uh, then we'll go ahead and sort of finalize this whole thing with her and get the money shipped to where it needs to go. And, and I, I love you all, and I thank you and those that are not here that were here to do it. Uh, okay, um, that's a homeless offering. All right, put on your calendar. Watch March the 14th. That's on a Saturday. And here's what it is. The Methodist men met, and we didn't really get to celebrate with our wives the Valentine thing that we did last year when we went over to Thompson's Cove, and we invited everybody, brought your girlfriend and this, that, your children, and we went over there and had a whole place to ourselves. John Anderson did a devotional, and we went over and had a meal. We have said we want to do that again on the 14th of March, so be thinking about it. We love come one, come all. And uh, we'll talk more about it as we finalize things and get closer. But just go look at your calendar and think about this, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It'll be Dutch treat. All right. Uh, Flo, I'll let you do your thing, please. And then, I, and then Ted wants to – I'm sorry. You go, you go ahead and then, and then let Ted uh, let you finish it up. Just a few words about Women of the Bible. Next Saturday morning, we'll start at 9 o'clock. Um, gathering at 8.30 to get ourselves registered. We have 120, 112 ladies registered um, and 27 churches represented, eight denominations represented. So it will be very diverse, but are bound together by our love of Christ. Um, if you need if you're coming and would like to have a hard copy of the scripture references they're on the little table out there also if you would want to go ahead and give your fifteen dollars today janine will be out there to receive them from you and circle and emmaus reunion group are reminded that we'll meet friday afternoon to set up at two o'clock is uh fund the hungry feed the hungry fund which i think this is a homeless offering i think that is and uh it says the family of donald r ames acknowledges and there is a check to my hopewell family as a thank you to all the acts of kindness we received don we would like to donate 500 dollars to the feed which is the homeless wow and so wonderful wonderful gift Good, thank you. Good, wonderful. Number 57, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. We'll sing the first four verses. 
Would you stand as we sing, please? <laughs> to the back of the hymnal to the Psalter and uh, page 777 is Psalm 42. I found this because we're talking about hungering and thirsting and, and this talks about longing for God, thirsting for God. So I'll read the light print if you'll read the dark and it continues on to the page beyond. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God. For the living God, when shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with loud shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you quiet, disquieted within me? Hope in God when again I shall praise my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Miser. Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, God's song is with me, a prayer to the God of life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I mourn because of the oppression of the enemy? Like a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me. They say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, when again I shall praise my help and my God. Amen. If you'll be we'll begin our time of prayer. We begin with petitions, and then following those petitions, silence, and I'll pray, and we'll join together in the uh, Lord's Prayer. I, I, I lift up Donna Bentley and the Bentley family as they grieve. The funeral was yesterday. The hospitality was yesterday. We pray for that grief. We know there are others within our congregation that have recent grief, and we pray for them. Uh, it, it is so good to see Carolyn and Ron Simpson, and Carolyn had a short time in the hospital, and everything good now, I think, and hope, everything so-so. Okay. Uh, Lord, hear our prayers. Other petitions. Good. Let's have a time of silence, and then we'll pray. Lord, we come together in, in kind of a rainy, dreary day. There may be people who didn't come today because of the weather. We pray, Lord, that in the midst of this, there would be the warmth of your word, the warmth of your spirit, the warmth of the fellowship, that we would say it was good to brave the elements and to come here today. We come together on a Sunday following a tremendous fundraiser. There were so many people who worked to get medical care for this young man who needs it so greatly. We pray, Lord, that all that he needs will come together and provide the healing that he needs so much. Lord, as we hear the needs lifted up, 
we realize that life is filled with tragedy and illness. There are no guarantees that everything is always going to go well. The guarantee we have is that you will be with us through all things. This morning we lift up a part of the, of the sermon, greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, a part of that sermon so hard to understand, something called the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are meek, uh, blessed are those who are persecuted. How can they be blessed? How can they be happy? And then the Beatitude today, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Many today are like this pastor. I don't know hunger. I don't remember a time when I needed water and couldn't get it. But we're talking about something else. We're talking about the need for spiritual nourishment. For those who make up the church, we are called to stir up that need in people and then to help them feel that need. We pray that you would make us and mold us to be your people, to be your church. When we are corrupt, we pray that you would purify us. When we are in error, redirect us. When we are divided, unite us. Lead us to be the people you call us to be. We pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll ask the ushers to come and we'll receive our tithes and offerings. Lord, this is a congregation that has demonstrated giving in so many ways, giving of themselves, giving of their service. This is part of the giving we do. Help us do it well in Jesus' name. Amen. If the I am the fan of quite a few preachers, some on television, some that I've heard in churches, and I'll go and I'll say, you know, that's the best sermon I've ever heard. Uh, in actuality, the best sermon that was ever delivered is in the fifth and sixth chapters of Matthew. We know it is the Sermon on the Mount. It is the, the classic sermon, and it starts out with a strange list. 
It is called the Beatitudes. Blessed are they, happy are they, in situations that just don't seem to make sense as far as something that might make you happy. If you have your Bible, I'm going to start at verse 1 and tell the whole story through verse 12. And when he saw the multitudes, he went on up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kind of evil against you faultly on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets before you. This is the word of God for the people of God, God. We read that list of Beatitudes, part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and it is very strange to me and maybe to you. Blessed is another way of saying happy. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are the meek. They just don't seem like things that ought to make us happy. And then there's one verse we're going to focus on today, and it is verse, I think, 6. And it said, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, Chuck preached at me today because I'm not someone who really experiences hunger. I love to eat, but I'm not really hungry. Pat and I go to Weight Watchers, and you might know I'm not one of their honor students. I just don't lose weight so easily. Uh, blessed are those who thirst. I've never really been thirsty. I've always been close to water. I can go in the kitchen. I've never wandered around the desert. I don't really know hunger and thirst. Uh, I want to do some research. Before we move into righteousness, I just want to talk a little bit about physical hunger in this country. Uh, when I do that, you know, it used to be in the old days, you'd go find books. Now you just go online. Do you realize there are 37 million people in this country that don't have enough to eat? In, in this land of abundance, 37 million. But here's the one that really hits your heart. One out of seven, every seven children in this country go to bed hungry. That's just an amazing thing, is it not? When you go to seminary, you experience some different kind of things. And, and, and so here's what happened to me one day. I went to chapel and there was an announcement. And they said, now, if, if you don't have anything planned for lunch, they said, there is going to be an Oxfam hunger feast in the dining hall. And I thought, well, that's very strange. I never heard those words together, hunger feast. I didn't know what Oxfam is, and I still can't tell you wholly the acronym, but it's basically Oxford, a committee on hunger relief. And so I went to the dining hall and there was a charge you would pay to get a ticket to go to this hunger feast. And I don't remember what the ticket was, but I thought it was very strange they were giving away different color tickets. And I didn't pay, I think mine was yellow, and I didn't pay attention to what was on the ticket. And I go up to where they're serving the food, and it is Mexican food, and I love Mexican food. And so I gave my ticket, and just as I'm giving it, my ticket said poverty. And I gave them the ticket, I had my tray, they gave me one empty taco shell and that's all they gave me so I went down to sit I don't know why I even wanted to sit 
And the people across from me, I looked at their tickets and theirs said affluent. And they had trays with all the Mexican food you'd ever want to eat. And I got ticked off and I started leaving the dining hall. And a lady who was one of the sponsors of this followed me. She said, what's wrong? I said, you know, I paid good money and y'all gave me one empty taco shell. She said, did you ever think about asking the people across the way, can I have some of your food? You've got plenty. In that dining hall that day, there was plenty of Mexican food for everybody, but we had to learn how to share. In our country today, you know we have plenty of food, but there are some people that don't have enough to eat because we just haven't learned to share. It's interesting. I do go to the mailbox. And I do get the mail, and this came from First Methodist Church, their newsletter, and it's something they're going to do. There's a, an international hunger relief program called Rise Against Hunger, and on February 23rd, their youth are going to package meals and the meals are going to go to schools and adult programs, hospitals and clinics. We have offerings like the homeless offering. We just need to keep in mind that there really are hungry people in our country. I, I want to say this, and, and I know you don't say amen, but I hopefully you'll nod. Uh, the beginning of November, you just have to prepare yourself, do you not? You know Thanksgiving is going to be coming. And you're not going to eat like Weight Watcher. And you know right on the heels of that is the Christmas season. And for at least a month, we're going to be eating like we shouldn't have eaten. And then you come to the end of December and you say, well, now I'm going to be good. But we have invented a whole new holiday called Super Bowl Sunday. And I don't know about you, but I don't sit in front of the TV with no food. I watch TV and I eat food. I, I, this was a, an accumulation from some years ago, and I did a sermon on the Super Bowl, and somebody computed how much we eat just during the time of the Super Bowl. Uh, Eight million pounds of popcorn, 28 million pounds of of potato chips, 53 and a half million pounds of avocados, 222, 792. That is the number of football fields it would take to grow the vegetables we eat that day. They eat vegetables? I don't know. And then <laughs> 11.8 feet deep. That is the depth of guacamole if you piled up all the guacamole on a football field. 293,000 miles of potato chips if you lay the potato chips end to end. I guess that's why they call them lace potato chips. And uh, <laughs> 1 billion chicken wings. Now listen to this. 325 and a half millions of gallons of beer consumed during one football game. Uh, it would take 493 Olympic-sized swimming pools to fill up with beer that's consumed on Super Bowl Sunday. On the Monday following, there is a 20% increase in antacids sold. <laughs> and on that Monday, there are 7 million employees who will call in sick because of what they did on Super Bowl Sunday. We know how to pig out. We know how to excess. Uh, you know, there are people that have responded to our excess. And, and you may know this story, and uh, I've, I've been to churches where youth groups would do this, and we don't do it so often. But the year was 1990, and there was an intern who was uh, serving as the youth director of a church in Columbia, South Carolina. And he stood up on the morning of Super Bowl and he prayed a prayer. He said, Lord, even as we enjoy the Super Bowl football game, help us be mindful of people who don't even have a bowl of soup to eat. And that began a ministry called 
the Super Bowl of caring, just for us to realize there are hungry people. But we're going to talk about hungering after righteousness. We're again in the Sermon on the Mount. We're in a list of Beatitudes. I'm going to say again how puzzling. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. But blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Are you to be thankful that you're hungry? But we finish the thought. And the thought is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are those who are spiritually hungry. Somebody once said, you are what you eat. And quite honestly, I don't eat a whole lot of salad and vegetables. And uh, when I go to fast food places, they all know me by name. And I think that says something. So we are what we eat physically, but we also are what we put in our hearts and souls and spirit. How do we feed ourselves then? I talk a lot about Uncle Willis, and he was my uncle. He's passed away. He was the uh, chaplain of a, a camp in Massachusetts, and he did magic tricks to uh, teach things to the children. And uh, I remember one of his magic tricks, and it was this. He had a partition, and there were two cutout figures of boys, and as he held them up, they were exactly the same size. He put them back behind the partition, and he said, let me tell you how these fellows sp fed themselves spiritually. Uh, fella number one, all he did was read comic books. He went to the Batman movies. He never did his homework. He never went to Sunday school, never did anything spiritual. And so Uncle Willis takes him out, and he's exactly the same size, supposed to be years later. He talks about the other fella. This other fella read classic books, uh, did all his homework, was an honor student, went to Sunday school, went to vacation Bible school, and Uncle Willis took him out, and he had grown really tall. The idea that if we're going to grow spiritually, we have to attend to our spiritual disciplines. We have to consume those things that would make us spiritual. Jesus talks about those who will be who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and he says that when we do that, we will be satisfied. I want to make a few points about hungering after righteousness. We hunger and thirst because righteousness is such a huge need in our life. It takes righteousness to come before the Lord and to be in his kingdom and to live in his kingdom. You know, in church, we throw out words and we think, what is that? Righteousness is very simply doing the right things, saying the right things, thinking the right thoughts. And, and so if we're followers of Christ, we will consume whatever it is that will make us grow. Sunday school, Bible studies, to consume those things. Uh, we carve out a righteous lifestyle for ourselves, and we are to model that lifestyle to our children and our grandchildren. We are supposed to be people who teach righteousness. We crave, we need to crave righteousness as much as we crave so many other things. C.S. Lewis commented on this, and he said the problem is that we crave the wrong things. You know, we worry about what am I going to eat, and what am I going to wear, and what am I going to drink, and if you read the Sermon on the Mount, he said, don't worry about these things. God is going to provide. And, uh, you know, it, we read the Sermon on the Mount. said, he, he knows every hair on your head. He provides for the lilies. He provides for the sparrows. We know God is going to take care of us. He said, and, and don't think that craving is a bad thing. It's just that we crave the wrong things. We need to crave after righteousness it says god's word is sweeter than honey and and, and we want to continually be filled with god's word crave after god's word one last point the only person who will ever be able to satisfy our hunger and thirst for righteousness is a person named jesus christ you know let's finish that verse blessed 
are the hungry, or those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Look through the Gospels, and Jesus said, you know, are you hungry? I'm the source of satisfaction. In John 6.35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be thirsty. He who believes in me will never be hungry. And, uh, you know, we sing a little song that says, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. I want to end with a, a poem, and this is uh, a lady named Clara Williams, and she wrote about how to be satisfied. She said, all my life I panted for a drink from a cool spring. I hoped it would quench the thirst, the burning of the thirst I felt within, feeding on the husk around me till my strength was almost gone, long my soul for something better, only still to hunger on. Poor I was and sought for riches, something that would satisfy, but the dust I gathered round me only mocked my soul's sad cry. Well of water ever springing, bread of life so rich and free, untold wealth that never faileth, my Redeemer is to me. Hallelujah. I've found him whom my soul has so long as craved. He satisfies my longings through his blood. I now am saved. We're going to sing a hymn, and, and in that hymn it says, It satisfies my longing as nothing else could do. And the hymn is, I Love to Tell the Story, and it's page 156. We're going to sing all four verses back to back, and then we'll sing the chorus at the end. Would you stand, please, as we sing? <laughs>
I, I think there are others like me, and we don't really physically hunger and thirst, but there needs to be a continuous hunger. And, and Lord, there needs to be a concern for those physically who are hungering and thirsting. Help us to quench our hunger and thirst and, and to help others quench their hunger and thirst. In Jesus' name, amen.